Yeah, we're going to be feeling good. Yeah. Okay. Good evening. Welcome to the uh, Town of Munster Board of Zoning Appeals meeting for Tuesday, November 15, 2022. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Roll. Yes, uh, Brad Hemingway. Here. Roland Rathen. Here. Uh, Daniel Buckset and Brian Speck are absent. Chairman, Chairwoman, Mayor. Here. President. Okay, we do have a quorum. Okay, our next item uh, up is the approval of the minutes from the October 11th meeting. Uh, do we have any um, corrections? I'll make a motion. I mean, wait a second. Uh, Tom, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Chair and Mayor? Yes. Grant Hemingway? Yes. Roland Rathen? Yes. Okay, motion carries. Okay, next item uh, we have no preliminary hearings. Moving on to public hearings. PCA docket number 22-014 Legacy Sign Group on behalf of Loop Oil requesting approval of a variance for a monument sign. Do we have anyone present? Yes, just me. Introduce yourself. Certainly. Uh, my name is Sean Edson, and I'm the owner of Legacy Sign Group located at 7933 West Highway 6. In Westville, Indiana. Okay. Um, Want to uh, tell us a little bit about your request? Certainly. So, um, this one, there's not a whole lot to it. Um, what I, I'm here on behalf of Luke Oil, um, representing them as our client, and they're looking to rebrand the existing Golo. Uh, located at 750 Broadmoor uh, to a Sitco uh, branding. Um, we are proposing and requesting um, approval from the board um, to allow a face change in the existing sign. Uh, the upper component um, will go from Golo, which is an internally illuminated uh, translucent uh, polycarbonate face to a routed face uh, with push through logo and uh, lettering, um, most of which are request, however, is um, to allow a 21 inch tall Sitco uh, logo that is um, per their brand standards um, that they require. Uh, the bottom faces will also be changed um, to pro from a polycarbonate to a routed uh, back with acrylic, so just a copy eliminates a line to brick. Uh, base structure will remain intact um, and um, we are under the understanding that the landscaping around the existing base also needs um, done and uh, to be to meet current code standards and that uh, the client uh, is agreed. The logo um, May, again, kind of going back, and you may see within your packet a non conform, uh, I guess that's the wrong term, a, a SICO brand standard that they um, really don't um, approve. Um, it's a, a much smaller logo versus their name. Uh, and as you can notice, there is a lot more white space, a lot more negative space. It doesn't fill that sign cabinet up uh, versus just the standard 21 inch tall logo. Um, not to jump different cases, uh, I was also here pretty much about a year ago uh, for 1750 West 45th Street, uh, that's Sitco, which is still in development. Um, and we did get a 21 inch tall logo um, approved there as well. So uh, I, ideally just seeking a very similar uh, brand standards here at the station. Okay, 
Well, Sean summarized the request very well. Um, as he stated, the maximum permitted letter and logo height on a mountain that sign is 12 inches, and they're proposing a 21 inch logo, so they're exceeding our standard. Um, and that's the basis for the request for the variance. Um, the only thing that I'll add is that uh, in your staff report, I have listed uh, the criteria by which the granting of a, a variance uh, would be uh, acceptable. And um, specifically, I noted that uh, one of the criteria is um, that the the uh, the applicant has to be experiencing something unique to their uh, property or their project. Um, in other words, there has to be something unique about this, the circumstances which would allow for the flexibility, um, which which is granted in a variance. Um, the one thing that I noted was that. There are a number of sort of legal non-conforming uh, monument signs throughout town. There's legal non-conforming signs um, that are uh, on walls. There are all sorts of uh, legal non-conformities given the, the number of changes that have been made to the sign ordinance over the past probably uh, seven years. And uh, the Planning Commission specifically amended our zoning ordinance to provide for um, modifications and changes to those legal nonconforming signs um, to the extent that those changes do comply with the, the standards. Um, so, in other words, uh, a sign that's legal nonconforming can remain, it can be modified, um, it can be changed, it can be updated. And, and uh, improved um, so long as those individual modifications and changes are not uh, sort of extending or uh, making larger the nonconformity. Um, so that's the sort of the situation throughout the community. Um, I have here on the screen a uh, BP a photo of a BP gas station on the corner of Main Street and Calumet Avenue. Uh, that's an example of a sign that was legal non-conforming and it was updated and improved with current standards or in a way that complied with the current standards. So you'll see that that, for example, that Helios logo, which is that sort of symbol of the BP, uh, company is on that sign and it's 12 inches tall. So it does comply. Um, so given that, um, you know, my, my take on this is that uh, the difficulties or hardships that are being uh, claimed to be incurred um, are not unique to this property and um, are in fact shared by uh, multiple properties within the town of Munster. And so I, I don't find that that criteria has been met by this variance request. And, and that's my why my recommendation is to deny it. If, if I could uh, add a, a follow up, if you don't mind. Um, thank you, Thomas. Um, one thing I, I do want to point out here in the specific BP, just because it's uh, on the screen for reference. Now, the logo treatment, um, you know, there is a logo on the canopy, and actually the, the logo on the canopy is much larger than the, the one on the sign face itself. This specific station is not going to have any SICA logo at all. They, they are looking to update the um, canopy graphics. However, there's not going to be any branding. And so this is really the only logo treatment uh, that we're seeking um, and requesting that's on this monument sign being proposed. Any questions from the board? No. Okay. Thank you. The one benefit is also your sign is like right up on the sidewalk. 
So you get a little, a little bit more visual aspect. I know you brought up the other side, the other Sitco station. That sign is, you know, you got a parkway, a sidewalk, so you are farther back. And I remember that one. That was my justification for giving that one. But it's one of my opinion. You're right on our main corridor street, and you're right on, right on the public way. So I don't know if I shop at gas stations going past regarding logos. Or if I shop and I see the sign here, Ford 29 a gallon or Ford that a gallon. But you recognize it as being, you know, like I recognize that you, I recognize that you have gas. <laughs> so <laughs> the compliance is uh, that you're asking for is the same on the one on the 45th. The the same one that we um, did seek out from the DCA and obtained approval on it. Tom, can you refresh on the, the Sitco on, on uh, Fran Lynn and Forty uh, Fifth? Is the the overall size the same? Um, that's a good question. I can check. Bear with me. Can't remember if that sign placed in the same location with the full sign was it pulled farther back? It's, I think it was in that same planting area, but it might have been back in the well to and, the and, and we're still uh, waiting on the uh, site surveys because of the vision triangle concern. Um, is that actually that new sign location? Uh, we're gonna have to be now further back and like half of that leg of that sign would that be in the parking lot. So um, we're currently working through the vision triangle. Uh, so we can make that. So the sign, the sign that was approved for the 45th Street gas station was six feet tall by seven feet two inches wide. My eyes are not what they used to be. Uh... Concern here is about about six and a half feet tall by five and two inches wide. So it's not as wide. It's and narrower and slightly taller. Okay. But square foot probably close to the same. I would think so, yeah. And it and it's similar in nature. I mean it's got the masonry below and then the, just the one one um tower. If you can see that oh it's, got it's a more. brick uh, entirely brick with the cabinet sort of embed it into it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And um, the masonry that is there, I had I did not get our test this in it. So is it in, is it in good condition? Yes. Now, I mean, you might, uh, I guess, think that the bottom uh, landscaping blocks might not be in, in the best appearance, essentially, but the actual brick itself, um, obviously, with the, uh, the, the structure itself, um, is fully intact. Any score feet in your mind that sign be pumped up? Um, I think it's 18 square feet. 18 square feet? Yes. Yeah. Probably double was it? Um, it's so in the in the staff report, it does look to existing non conformity. So the height, maximum permitted height is six feet. The actual height of the sign is six feet five and a quarter inches. Sign area, the maximum is 18 square feet permitted, and the actual is 22 square feet. Um, the location of the sign is uh, 
for the code to be 10 the setback 10 feet from the property line and this is basically right on the property line um, and landscaping is supposed to have a minimum of three feet of landscape on all sides in actuality it has i don't know the exact amount but it's less than three feet and uh, the sign trace material is required to be authentic brick, stone, or solid metal or wood. And the actual is this um, like aluminum cabinet. So those are kind of the existing nonconformities. Again, a sign that is legal nonconforming can be modified and changed and improved to the extent that those modifications comply with the standards. So it's pretty out of compliance right now. Compared to our it is, uh, although you know it was it was built under previous set of standards. So the idea with that, as you probably recall, with that amendment was to say, all right, we understand that you there's a certain uh, level of certainty that one wants to have as far as like I bought a piece of property or I invested in a sign, I don't want to have to demolish it and start over invest thousands of dollars on a new sign uh, you know every time the town changes their ordinances um, so that's why we kind of made that right. that sort of flexibility as far as modifying and changing the legal mark for the sign basically we need to get a little better on enforcement regarding the landscape around the sign that report that would maintain your well, I don't know the circumstances with this particular GOLO sign that was installed before I was working here and we went back and looked to see if there was a permit or something and we could not find any record of the permit. Um, our understanding is that there was, when this particular gas station kind of changed from being a shell station to the GOLO, station they appeared before the planning commission to get approval for the development plan there were at a preliminary hearing there were a number of things that they were supposed to do uh, that were identified by the planning commission but they never came back for the second hearing they withdrew their application and then made a number of the different improvements but didn't sort of get like the approvals for them so it's kind of a murky situation from our perspective, and we don't really know why that happened. It was so a legal non conforming sign that's not legal because we never got a permit for it. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's the situation, it's kind of unusual. Yeah. So they took the pole sign down or put up the manual sign at that point, right? Okay. Yeah, so there was a pole sign, and I think in their from their perspective, my sense is that they thought, well, well they told us to change. This to a monument sign, so we'll do it. I don't know why they didn't get a permit. I don't know if they didn't. I just don't know the circumstances. Like I said, we don't have a good record of it either. So um, I don't think we can hold any ill will towards this no. application based on that because I don't think Sean had anything to do with it. No, no, no. Like I said, did not do orders are doing the right thing. Any other questions for Sean? So we're going to go ahead and open. This is a public hearing. So we're going to go ahead and open it up, up to the public. Anyone online? We have two people online here. I'm new. If uh, either would like to speak, you may do so now by unmuting yourself and speaking. I'm not seeing any response from the Zoom. People. No hand raising. No. Okay. Okay. Well, in that case, that will close the public hearing. Bring it back to the board. My opinion on this corridor, Cadman Avenue, with everyone coming to town, the signs should be consistent. You we know, don't target to a consistent basis on your signs. Obviously, BP down the street was a good example, Tom. And I agree with staff on their report about. Sign letter sized. That was the whole purpose of the words. Well, in you know, in, in my case, I, I 
I feel like the, the sign that that we approved for the, the Fran Linen 45th is a much more attractive sign than, than that. And um, would it, you know, would it fit there? In this instance, I see a, I see a traffic light there. And I don't know how large that uh, a landscaping area is to accommodate a, a little bit larger base. There's not much room there in the corner. I go by there every day. Yeah, part of the issue too with that sign is that it is within that exit. It's within that sort of vision triangle. Um, it was placed in the same location as the pole sign. Um, pole signs were permitted within that. Triangle because they're up there, you know, they're not down yeah, at just a pole. car level. Um, so when it was taken down and put on the ground, it really should never have been put there because of that. Um, but it is, so I wouldn't recommend making it any wider okay. or, or larger. Is there um, a better location for, for some of the line in this side? Not on this property. <laughs> There's, it's very, very minimal. There's, yeah, there's really not a lot of uh, on these old gas stations. There's not a lot of empty space really to. Sharon, uh, if I may, um, just for the record, uh, the Indiana law provides that uh, action of the Board of Zoning Appeals is not official unless it's authorized by a majority of the entire membership of the board. So as far as the night goes, that one way or the other, it's going to be passed. Am I right, Tom? Any thoughts on that? That's my understanding, yes. So, if we deny this petition, then, then the sign stays the way it is, basically. They could change your copy for code. Right, Tom? Yeah, but it it would just require that you know they figure out a way to have a twelve foot or I'm sorry, twelve inch uh, letters logo. That's BP then, right? Right. So I'm my guess is that they'd have to negotiate something with their corporate you know, branding officer to get a special approval to do a either a different size logo or you know, different ratio between the letters and the logo or standalone logo or something. Or they just make it, you know, the Sitco letters, you know, proportionately smaller. So uh, did you have something in mind if the, if the result of this was going to be a, a denial of the petition? Well, really, I mean, we have, Kind of already have on the table um, just the proposed other design that was already shared with the client that Sitco originally denied. Um, so it, that's going to be internally in between them. So that one um, meets code? That one meets code. That's a 11 and 7 8 um, trademark. Um, it's nice and black. And eight inch tall letters. Um, so that was again denied by them by their branding standards. But again, that's going to be an internal battle that they'll have to lose and, and discuss. So. Yeah. But if we deny, then he can't come back for a year or more. If he wants to, right? I mean, it would be the yeah, depending on what the, the app, what the request would be, similar type of request. So, you know, substantially similar request cannot be brought right back. So what I'm getting at is, <clears throat> would it be better to table it and you go back to them and tell them that it's going to get denied and then you're not going to be able to do anything for a year? Well, I can understand that in a lot of instances. And we did do that um, at the 45th Street uh, variance request. But in, in, in my eyes and in the client's eyes, there's really no other backup plan here that could get approved essentially. So the backup plan is we just do the bases and per 
just standard firmware. And that would be just as designed 11 and 7 eighths. That, that really is the backup plan. So, so then you don't need a variance. You're just going to do it with a lot of tech code. Again, I don't know that they're going to approve it. Right. I can't answer that. I would just assume that there really is nothing for me to table to go back to them and say, hey, let's try this, let's try this. There really isn't that. Much like a design or you know, a, a new pylon sign, things like that. I can go back and we can, you know, renegotiate some things, but this there really not is no it's second tier option. Go back to the other phone kind of one that needs code. So, not to make a case or one way or the other, we did look into the Seiko branding standards, and it's actually, it's been, it is very specific. It says you cannot sort of change the proportions of the logo uh, in, the, in the text. So, they're very strict about that um, without getting like very, you know, special approvals through, through their marketing department or something like that. So, One aside, I guess, yeah, we can back your marketing department a little bit. If we don't have three tonight, then what happens then? Three tonight, you have no official action taken at this point. Yes, that has happened often. That's what I'm going to say. On behalf of the clerk, I like that. That was added, so yeah, you can't. Yeah, I had to go through. Next month, then? Yeah. Okay, no time to get feedback from them. I, I think, in my eyes, I think just with. I'm not sure what additional feedback we could come with, to be honest with you, and, and present to the board. Uh, I, I, I think I'm just, in my own consulting, and I'm just then extending my bill onto the client even further for, in, in, in for what? And, and, you know, I hate to just, and I appreciate that. I, I see you guys are trying to to work with us and, and work with the client, and I, and I can't appreciate. It. I just don't know that there's something else that we can provide here that would be any different than essentially this design that would essentially get permitted. Well, that being said, I like the one that fits within our within our standards. Therefore, I'm making a motion to deny the petition. And it's up to you this time. I mean, wait, sir. I'm going to have a motion and a second. Okay. There's no discussion. Call the rule. Um, okay. This is a motion to deny the variance. So by voting in favor, you're voting for denial. Uh, Brad? Anyway? Yes. Roland Rapid? Yes. Sharon Mayer? No. So, her is no. Right. Correct. Okay. I'm the Okay. Does there need to be a motion to defer or is it just. No, I think I think there's no alternative to do it. Okay. Just a few seconds. So, we do because of the. So basically, your options are put this sign in or come back when we have a full house and maybe you'll get three to five. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have no findings of fact. Uh, next item is additional items for discussion. Request for determination whether electric vehicle charging stations are a permitted accessory use in several districts. Yes. Um, 
So every so often we we have a proposal that uh, is it's ambiguous as far as whether or not it's uh, permitted or, or what the how the zoning ordinance would address uh, a question. Um, and in those cases, uh, the Board of Zoning Appeals has the authority to make a determination as to whether or not um, staff's interpretation is correct or whether or not staff's question, how to answer a question from the staff regarding um, the interpretation of the zoning ordinance. So in this case, um, we uh, had a site plan review committee meeting with a representative from the Tesla company. And uh, they were proposing to install electrical electric vehicle uh, charging stations within the parking lot at the Target store in Munster. Um, and they have an agreement with, uh, with Target to, to install these stations throughout the country in their parking lot. Uh, we reviewed it, we gave some, some comments and some feedback, but ultimately um, we kind of scratched our head and said, said, we don't know if this is a specific permitted use because you have a sort of like a, not quite a gas station, fueling station type of use, uh, but it's also very different from that in the sense that, you know, there's no underground infrastructure, there's no convenience store, there's no pay apparatus. Um, it's basically just the use of an existing parking lot with the addition of some charging posts and some generators um, to allow people to either charge their vehicles while they're shopping or um, stop when they're traveling, pull in and charge their electric vehicles. Um, and so there's different types of these charging uh, stations. There are, those are listed in the report, level one, level two, and level three. And those are kind of level one is the slowest, level three is the quickest. The level three are the, the Tesla chargers are level threes. Um, this specific proposal for Target was a combination of level two and level three. So there would be certain posts that would only be available to Tesla owners or Tesla vehicles, and then the other folks that would be available to any electric vehicle. Um, and I'm just, I'm using this specific proposal as an example. I'm not necessarily asking for input on this specific one, um, but as I said, there's no permitted accessory use in our code called electric vehicle charging infrastructure or something like that. Um, and however, there is a kind of catch all permitted use, which is uh, defined as other uses that are subordinate and customarily incidental to a permitted principal use. Uh, and in our sort of internal discussions, we came down as far as that this could possibly, given the sort of proliferation of this type of charging stations, you know, there's one at the town hall. I just learned today that there's some at the community hospital. So they're, they're starting to become more and more common. And um, so we're seeking kind of a determination from you as far as would you consider this type of uh, installation in a parking lot to be a use that is subordinate and customarily incidental to a permitted principal use. So in other words, is this something that will commonly and typically be found in a commercial parking lot, in a manufacturing parking lot, and in a parking lot in a planning and development? If the board makes that determination, then this would be considered a permitted use. And any business that wanted to do this could install these these charging chargers in their parking lot. Um, I would say they would still be subject to the other standards of the zoning ordinance. So they still have to meet our standards with respect to signage, lighting, any landscaping, any screening that would be required, particularly of generators. We require screening of 
uh, utility infrastructure. So all those things would still have to be met. They just wouldn't have to go through any special approval process. They would be approved administratively through the building permit process. I um, wouldn't want to install big generators in front of our commercial buildings, do we? Well, that's the question. I mean, I think the question is, is this something that would be, and I brought, I've got some examples of what this would look like. Um, and I provided the, the Tesla packet that they provided to us. And this is kind of, you can see that's a Tesla charging station. And so with this, you can see there is kind of like a utility um, generator compound. In this case, the, it's screened both by fence and by landscaping. Um, you can see like that's, that's what it would look like in the parking lot. So in the picture above that, though, I see looks like two vertical generators. Or is that what that? Two and one bigger one. That one, right? The top photo there. Can you enlarge that? Yeah, transformers or something. Yeah. <clears throat> Right, so this is not the proposal for Munster. This is just a sort of an example from another community. In Munster, you know, we would require that this, you know, this utility infrastructure be screened in some form or fashion. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to point out is that we would also still have the same parking standards as far as a certain parking spaces are being given over to charging station and customers are not permitted to park there. And we, of course, have to make sure that, you know, they're still meeting that with their minimum parking standards. Yeah. yeah, but that's, I mean, that's essentially what it would look like. You can also, um, like I said, there's one in our parking lot out here, which it just went in. I mean, there was no, Discussion of zoning or anything. Is there a generator for it? Um, I don't know what. I there's something out there, but it's. <laughs> you should need a generator. Generator just for the campus. Um, yeah, not a generator. It's, it's it's like a transformer or something like that. But um, anyway, that's that's the question before you. I have a question. So. Can you give us some examples of other accessory uses that are in that are allowed under the code? Um, yeah, let me like that. Like, um, well, one that we talked about sort of internally was like, all right, um, Target. Target is a retail store, um, but they have Starbucks inside, right? So that's a that Starbucks is an exception technically an accessory use to the primary use, principal use, which is a retail store. Um, there are, I think in uh, like a Walgreens, for example, or CVS, you'll often have, like in CVS, I think they have a minute clinic. So that's an accessory use to the main use, which is the pharmacy and the drugstore and the retail component. Um, you might have, I'm trying to think if there's anything external. Like sometimes you'll see a bank in the grocery store. Yeah. You like that? Yeah. So okay. all of those are examples of, it's not the primary use, but it's accessory use. Yeah. Okay. Well, you don't need an answer tonight. It sounds like to pick it up before next month. Uh, there's no public hearing or preliminary hearing or anything. It's, it's really, um, if you want more time to think about it, that's fine. I understand that. Uh, but like I said, if if the board decides that okay, this seems like something that is typically going to be associated with a retail or a you know commercial use, then it can be approved administratively. If the board decides that no, we don't really think that this falls under that category. This is something unique. Um, then I think what I would do is I would take to the plan commission and given that these things are proliferating, we're gonna to have to come up with some approach to it. Um, so I think we would talk about at the planning commission level, what do we need to do in the zoning ordinance to 
you know, permit and regulate these. Well, they are one way in the future. I know when I'm going to order yeah. of, um, of a Culver's, uh, you know, hamburgers, and the one that's at um, 114 down in position four, and he put one in his parking lot so that people will charge their cars while they're eating their hamburgers. So I mean, this is the way it's going to go. Right. So do we want to uh, have a, you know, a, a petition every time somebody wants to put one in the parking lot? Yeah, and as it, that's, so I guess from my perspective, um, you know, if I could make a recommendation, my recommendation would be that we would just consider this to be a, um, an accessory use that would be typically associated with these types of using commercial uses, just because we are seeing them. Some of them have already been installed. Uh, they don't really seem to be all that disruptive or intrusive in any way. Um, I think the key thing would be in a situation like this, you just would have to make sure that because there are certain certain spaces that will only be only can be used by like a Tesla, um, that that's not decreasing the number of parking spaces for the entire business such that it's falling below that minimum standard. And I'm not messing with the parking lounge that want to park right in front of that store. They better have the location in the right spot. Well, if you were to look at the site plan, again, we're not we're not really reviewing the site plan itself, but what they had proposed was that it be installed. Yeah, you can kind of uh, see it basically right here, accessible from the driveway, not up close by the. By oh, the is that store. like in, by near the windows? Yeah. Okay, so it's a little way, ways away from the entry. Right. Center. Yeah. So, um, but as far as even, you know, if, if, if we determined that we thought it was an accessory use, you would still have to develop some code around it, right? As far as like what you just said about the parking, the, the, if there is, you know, generators or whatever <clears throat> infrastructure for it. Well, I think we have standards in place that would address all of those concerns. So, for example, there are minimum parking standards for a, a retail use. Target has to meet those. If Target says that, oh, we're going to designate a certain portion of our spaces for um, charging stations, they can't, if, if that's the case, those spaces are no longer available for that commercial use. And therefore, they potentially could have short, not enough spaces. So we would be, that would be something that we would just review administratively, okay, you have to make sure you have enough extra spaces, you know, anything that you, you install has to be screened, illuminated, signed, landscaped, in, in accordance with the standards that are already there for any type of, um, you know, modification to a parking lot. So I, I feel fairly comfortable that this can be done in a way that's not, you know, that we really don't need any new standards for them um, at this point. Now, if we were to get some kind of a massive, again, I just don't see that being the case, but this is a, this is also going to only, we're not asking for like a principal use. So it would still be prohibited as a principal use as far as, you know, somebody buys a lot and just turns it into a, a charging station. It would have to be accessory to an existing permitted use. Do you recall when the, um, uh, the, the marathon gas station that that's by the railroad tracks off the diner, when when they were here about their reopening of the car wash? Yeah. And they said at that time that you know if it, if the the gas station proved to be relevant, then then they would consider rebuilding it and putting in charging stations there as well. Okay. So in that case, you know, where 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 would that fall at in the scenario? Um, well, I guess we'd have to determine what is the what would be the principal use of the of the property. If, if the 
principal use is a gas station, then they still need to get approval for the gas station. And if they want to add chargers to the gas station, that would be fine. But they can't just, they wouldn't be able to open up sort of administratively a charging, like a, a charging station. That is just only was that. only charging station, not gas. Right, right. And that's, that's, this is only, for, like, what we're asking is just a determination as to whether or not could be permitted as an accessory use. Gotcha. Okay. So I have to do some research and see if we can find out some other local codes in regards to charging stations and down. Yeah, I did a little bit of research and um, it kind of, kind of runs the gamut, but if you want me to come back next month with a little more or some of that, you know, listed out, I can kind of summarize that, provide that to you. Because obviously this one's right by the highway, so you could have the potential for a lot more charging stations being asked on this property. Yeah. In the proximity of the highway, right? That's right. That's right. There are maps that are designed to find charging stations right off the uh, expressway. So. Okay, well, I'll be on record saying that I believe that it is. A could we consider an accessory use? Because I'm not going to be here next month. Okay. Okay. So our next regular business meeting is December 13th. I will be in Key West. Okay. We'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you.
Discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> the motion passes. Um, next item, I'm going to change the agenda around. Um, I'm going to call Community Foundation up because there's going to be quite a bit of discussion on the other stuff. Thank you. So I know yours is. Uh, yeah. He really wants to stay for the whole yeah, time. I'm really <laughs> happy to be here. So the next item on the agenda is PC 22021 Community Foundation of Northwest Indiana requesting approval for of a final plot for Community Foundation uh, Incorporated Edition Block 5, a three lot commercial subdivision at 10240 Calumet Avenue. Tom, I'll turn this over to you for a presentation. Okay, thank you. The plat is shown there on uh, the screen and was provided in the packet. Um, I'll just note that uh, the Planning Commission approved the preliminary plat for this Community Foundation Inc. edition Block 5 in June of 2022. Um, there were a number of uh, conditions uh, put on the approval, including uh, execution of an agreement to install a traffic signal at the, at the intersection of Treadway and Calumet Avenue, uh, thoroughfare trees to be planted in the Calumet Avenue Parkway, uh, north of Treadway and a six foot sidewalk installed along Calumet Avenue south of Treadway Drive. Uh, those conditions have been met. Uh, so the preliminary plat uh, stands as approved. Um, they've now requested approval of the final plat. And um, as you know, uh, final plat can be uh, approved upon the, uh, the completion of all public improvements. Um, or uh, a bond submitted uh, for their completion. Um, so the, the Community Foundation of Northwest Indiana has uh, submitted a bond in the amount of 115% of the public improvements that, that have been reviewed uh, by the town staff and uh, determined to be acceptable. So at this point, um, the, we recommend that uh, the Planning Commission approved the Community Foundation in addition Block 5 final plat. Any questions, comments, concerns? I just have a quick question for the gentleman. When do you expect the first building to be up? Uh, we're hoping October of next year. Of next year. Yeah, yeah. Our foundations are basically in for the building right now. We're hoping to receive this deal uh, in December. So we're going to start seeing steel red should then, and then hopefully get the shell build and then build up the interior. The only reason why I'm asking is because I I am definitely pushing to make sure that the traffic flag is up and running. And by the time that building is up and operational. So that's why I asked. Yeah. Some of the underground we're trying to make sure that that is in while we're working along the county. I'm just letting you I'm so we're not letting you know that 
that's what I'm going to be working on. So okay. appreciate right. it. Thank you. No questions. Okay. Any other questions? We have a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve the Community Foundation Edition Black Five Point Flat. Motion for the second. I'll second. Um, any other discussion? Tom, would you please call roll? Councillor Coltreras? Yes. Councillor Chibowitzki? Yes. Rachel Brannigan? Yes. Bill Baker? Yes. Chairman Rev? Yes. Thank okay. you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Yep, you too. Right. Good. You too. There are no preliminary hearings on the schedule. There's a public hearing. We'll start out with PC docket number 22017, Spin Munster LLC, Representative Year Local, requesting approval of a preliminary plot for Kenmara Phase 1 of an addition to the Town of Munster, a commercial subdivision located at the southwest corner of Timber Drive, Manor Avenue, and Fisher Street. Now I'll turn this over to you. Okay, thank you. I put up on your screen. Um, a visual representation of this uh, proposal. Uh, this is phase 1A of the Ken Morrow subdivision. The plan commission has already granted a conditional approval for the preliminary plat of phase 2, which is the actual uh, first part of the development of the Lansing Country Club. Uh, this is the action that would allow for the extension of Fisher uh, street to the west and uh, the reconfiguration of the intersection of Timrick uh, Manor and Fisher Street. Uh, this is the, was heard by the Planning Commission in a preliminary hearing and an initial public hearing. Uh, the, there's been a couple different iterations of this plan being presented. Uh, at the public hearing, the last public hearing, uh, there was a plan presented to modify Manor Avenue uh, by extending it, kind of turning it west and connecting it into uh, Timrick and then the, the combined road intersecting West Fisher Street. Uh, there was a bit of discussion about that, and uh, staff actually recommended that it be tabled. Uh, after the, the meeting, uh, Staff met with the applicant, uh, Gary Warfell of Saxon Partners LLC, and we reviewed four different alternatives for this intersection. Uh, those are listed here in your staff report. Uh, I'm just going to go through it. I'll be quick about it, but I do want to go through each one and just kind of talk about taking them over the pros and cons uh, of each one, just so everyone's aware, because I know we had a pretty Robust discussion. Before you do that, should we turn that screen toward when I was sitting back there? No, the group could not see it. Yeah, good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. So, the first alternative that we looked at was uh, the one that's being presented here tonight. It's uh, Timber terminating at Manor Avenue. Um, the, uh, the pro, I guess we, I, we kind of separated this into pros and cons for each one. So the pros of this um, alternative is that it maintains street connectivity for emergency response, public works, residents, and so on. Um, it reduces the overall number of pedestrian street crossings. There's minimal shifting of traffic and it creates additional green space. Um, the con, cons for this alternative were uh, that vehicles on Timrick would, as we discussed, be pointed directly at the bonds at 8837 and 8841 Manor, with the possibility of headlights uh, possibly disturbing residents. Um, the other con was that there could be potential tra traffic backups on Timrick. So again, this this alternative has Timrick here terminating into Manor, and then a four-way intersection at Fisher Street. Uh, Second alternative that we looked at was the one that was presented at the hearing last month. Um, it has similar connectivity and a reduced number of uh, pedestrian street crossings. Again, minimal shifting of traffic and additional green space. 
Uh, the major issue with this, the major sort of negative component of this alternative was that uh, it kind of created an odd situation in front of the houses at 8841 and 8837. If you remember, um, there would have been parkland that was kind of dedicated right in front of these, these residential lots. And so staff had some concerns about the maintenance responsibilities and um, the fact that there would be uh, basically no frontage for the lot at 8841. Uh, one other option that was brought up at the meeting last month was Timrick terminating at a cul-de-sac. Um, there were some benefits to this that we found, uh, just calm traffic on the south leg of Timrick reduces overall number of pedestrian street crossings, creates a significant amount of green space, um, and has fewer intersections, possibly improving automobile safety. The major drawback on this um, was the fact that it would have some unknown, possibly significant shifting of traffic to Manor Avenue and to other streets, um, given that it cuts off uh, what's currently considered a a major collector for the town. Um, and then secondly, it uh, doesn't maintain street connectivity for emergency response, public works, and residents. Final alternative that we reviewed was the original alternative, uh, which was a roundabout at the intersection. Saw a number of benefits to that. Uh, Primarily, the probably the, the biggest benefit was the continuous flow of uh, vehicles with no backup because there are no stop signs associated with the a roundabout. Um, but the sort of the drawbacks were that um, there is a reduced amount of green space, an increased number of pedestrian crossings. So, for example, if one wants to, you know, uh, head northwest, they'd have to cross like three or four streets. Um, Clearly has an extremely large footprint, um, a high cost, and uh, the need for additional easements on the Nipsco right of way, which is down here. So um, all that is to say that after uh, sort of meeting together and putting our heads together, um, it was determined that essentially alternative one, which was timber terminating at Manor, was preferred by the developer and acceptable to the town staff. Um, so our consensus as a staff was that alternative one could move forward. So that's the background. That's where we are. That's the plat that we being presented tonight is um, that alternative one. Uh, the plat itself is a set of uh, right-of-way dedications and uh, vacations and then parcels being uh, reconfigured. So it, if you were to look at this document, it's, it's kind of hard to understand exactly what's going on here, but you'll see this is a Timrick Drive extending east into Manor Avenue. This is an existing portion of Timrick Drive that's being uh, vacated as road right of way and dedicated uh, to the Parks Department so that um, it's all kind of said and done. It looks going to look like, sorry, but I don't think this would be a little touchy. Looks like that. So that's a kind of a graphic representation of what's all included on that flight. You'll see there's that vacation of right away right here. Uh, the dedication of new right of way for Tim Rick Drive and um, the dedication of these open space parcels as parkland. Uh, Fisher Street itself is uh, widened to have a left hand turn lane uh, to go north. And the proposal is to have a stop sign here at uh, Manor and Fisher, and then a stop sign here at Tim Rick and Manor. I won't go through all of the uh, considerations in the, in the staff report here, but I will point out a couple, a couple things of note. Uh, the first is that 
and these are kind of related to some of the conditions that I recommended. Um, but the traffic study that was uh, completed for this project indicated that um, there would be, with the full implementation and the full construction of phase two and phase three of the development, there would be a need for a uh, traffic signal here at this intersection. Um, it states further in that study that with the implementation of phase two, which is the first part of the development, um, there's a potential for backups on Manor Avenue north past the Timberlake Drive intersection um, during peak hours, peak evening hours. And uh, what I recommended was that the town basically monitor this intersection to determine whether or not any additional uh, measures be taken up to and including the installation of a traffic signal uh, prior to the implementation of phase three uh, when it would be required. Um, so one of the recommendations that we have is actually a, that upon approval of this plan, that uh, the town require an agreement similar to what we require for the Community Foundation of Northwest Indiana with the project that we just have approved the final platform, which is to say when uh, traffic warrants, traffic signal warrants are met, the developer would be required to install a traffic signal. That's in keeping with the traffic study provided. Um, but if there was a situation prior to the, those warrants being met, where the town desired a traffic signal, then the town could go in, install the signal, and then be reimbursed by the developer at the time that the warrants are met, which could be at a later date. So where we are recommending that that be a condition. Um, I would assume if you're improving this whole intersection, you could do all the infrastructure at one time and have it ready to go and just got to pop the lights in, right? Uh, as far as you know, putting in the underground infrastructure in, suggesting can you make sure you're talking? Sorry. Uh, well, that would be up to them, I would say. But uh, in any case, at, at some point in the future, if the warrants are met, then the signal would be required. Um, other than that, uh, our recommendation, like I said, based on our review of these different alternatives, is to uh, approve. But there are conditions listed in our recommendation. And in addition to that traffic signal agreement, we're also asking that a revised land, landscaping plan be provided uh, both for the street, so something that conforms to our streetscape standards, and also for the park areas to be approved by the Town Monster Parks and Recreation Department or the Monster Park Board. Uh, we need a revised public lighting plan and um, we also uh, would be seeking uh, final town engineer approval of all engineering plans before it could move forward, as well as similar to phase two, all the necessary easements, agreements, and approvals both by the town and third parties, including NIPSCO, NICD, um, and the town council and the redevelopment commission, as far as the transfer of right of way and the and uh, the acceptance by the park board of these improvements. Um, and then finally, uh, granting a waiver from section 26.335 um, of the subdivision ordinance to permit a right of way width of less than 100 feet for a commercial street. So that being said, I know that um, uh, Gary Warco, the applicant is on Zoom, but he's represented here by his engineer landscape architect, uh, Daniel Grove, and I know that they also have um, some additional material that they put together that they'd like to talk through. Okay. Any questions for Tom before I turn it over to the commissioner? Mr. Okay. Chairman, I have one. Is there a development agreement yet? No. So why is Planning Commission dealing with all of these approvals and having redoing of streets if there's no deal yet? Uh, part of the reason is uh, we need to kind of get consensus from the plan commission that the development as proposed um, is acceptable, meets our standards. If there are, 
you know, we've had a lot of discussion about the layout of streets and roads, and that's a planned commission activity. And that I think that conversation needed to happen at the planning commission prior to the town council sitting down and coming up with a, a financial incentive package. The, this doesn't have anything to do with the stacking for the train. Does the train have a grade crossing there or is that flyover? It will be an at grade crossing. So how is that particular setup working with regards to having a train? Now granted, I'm assuming it's not a freight train that's going to be a while. It's only going to be a short stack, but how does that impact that? And is that going to be a um, grade crossing with um, a quiet zone? It will be a quiet zone, yes. Uh, it will be at grade and there will be probably some minimal uh, effect of that crossing closing. Um, the train will be moving fairly quickly at that point and the gates will be down for like, you know, 30 seconds. Well, it starts to climb there though, doesn't it? So um, I'm not so sure how well that thing that 1905 technology is going to climb that grade. I think it'll be fine. It's, okay. it, it's making sure it's only a matter of seconds. And plenty of power right there, so if they need some extra credit. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? I do have a question about um, the open space parcel on uh, the bottom right. Are we taking another house in this scenario? And have they been, have they discussed that with them? Uh, no, that's a good question. That lot and has already been purchased by the developer. Oh, okay. So there are three lots that have been purchased by the developer, one here and then two on, on Timrick. Has somebody from the town reached out to those homeowners who have Timrick facing them now in this proposal? Uh, yeah, as, as a matter of fact, I spoke with both of the residents last week. And I think one of them is here. Um, well, executive summary. I, uh, they, well, I don't want to put words in, in their mouths here, but uh, my sense is that they, I would, I, yeah, know, it's a public hearing tonight, so I would let, let them. Okay. Themselves. Thank you. Can I speak? No, no, we'll no, have a public hearing. We'll have a look at it for that for sure. Any other questions for Tom? That being said, I'll turn it over to the commissioner. Please state your name and address for the record. Daniel Grove with Kimberly Horn, 4201 Winfield Road, uh, Warrenville, Illinois. Um, as Tom mentioned, Gary's dialed into the Zoom. If there's any specific questions for him, um, I'm happy to answer any that I can as well. I think we don't really want to spend a lot of time. You've seen this a couple of times now. Um, you know, you've approved uh, phase two and, and tonight and back to back items. You know, we're, we're looking to uh, address getting access to this site. So the, the phase 1A and phase 1B, the, the Fisher connection and the Maple Leaf Boulevard connection. Um, so as you see just in reference, there's there's our site, uh, what Saxon is looking to develop. If we go to the next slide, um, you know, we're, we're highlighting that phase 1A and then phase 1B. Again, this is a very landlocked parcel. And so to, to make it active and productive and supportive of the community, uh, we need these access points that we're in front of you tonight for. Uh, if we go to the next slide, just a recap of that phase two development that was uh, approved back in July. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, here's the, the plat that you'll be seeing later in the next item, which is the Maple Leaf Boulevard plat. Tom will, I'm sure, introduce that. Um, that gives us access uh, from Maple Leaf Boulevard, providing access for County map up to the site uh, through NIPSCO under the NIPI tracks. Uh, and then, as Tom just discussed, um, this is the, the, the proposal that we're reviewing right now with phase 1A access. Um, we want to make traffic better in the neighborhood. We want to work with the community and work with um, the town to, to address that. Uh, and, and we think that you know, we've been very thoughtful about approaching this as you saw from. With Tom, we've, we've looked at several different options. Sat down with fire and police and, and planning and, uh, to make sure that the, that we're going with the best option. There's no perfect option, but we think that through design, you know, Gary's reached out and talked to those neighbors. Um, we're offering landscape and other enhancements to their site. We've lined up the road 
to line up with the driveway between the two uh, buildings on the east side of the manor so that we're uh, not shooting headlights into their windows. So we're trying to do this as sensitively as possible and, uh, and work with those residents. Um, and I think the last thing that we wanted to touch on, if we jump ahead a couple slides, uh, that was the old alignment that Tom went over. Um, let's go one more slide. We we do see this as really making a lot of connections uh, in the community. One, you know, taking this parcel that has been kind of landlocked behind Nipsco uh, right away and, and making it productive and supportive to the community, to the hospitals. Um, but also we see it as a huge opportunity to really make some amazing regional greenway connections uh, through the site to link up Pepsi Greenway and link up into other regional trail networks. Um, so we just wanted to highlight that. So I think that's a big benefit to this project as well. Um, so with that, I'm here to answer any questions. Gary's on the line to answer any questions, but we appreciate your time. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for the commissioner? Have you and Gary reviewed the staff recommendations as conditions for the for the motion? And you agree to all the conditions that staff is presented in my documents tonight? Yes, I, and I think we we view that obviously there's a development agreement that needs to occur, and that's a lot of these items are going to get wrapped up into that development agreement. But yeah, I think yeah, we want to work with the town to to achieve this, and, and I think that moving this forward, we recognize that we got to get Pepsi Co on and we'll talk to us about B. We you know we have to get kind of all the pieces in, in place um, and and get the final engineering the way that the town wants it. So. This is a public hearing, and if anyone would like to come up and speak on behalf of the public, just come up to the microphone and state your name and address for the public record. And if you could also sign the sign in sheet, that would be great too. You want to go first? Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, thank you. My name is Jenna Parker, and I live on 8837 Manor Avenue, which is where this. Jump out of some rental basically. Be. Is it the first house, ma'am, or the second house? It will be for the open space parcel. I'm the second house from that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, they've given us a lot of literature on this. I know there's a lot of work involved in planning this on, on everyone's behalf. But um, my husband and I, we have two young kids. And my biggest concern, especially as we've seen a lot of recent accidents and speeding, even down Ridge Road is if a car decides that they're just going to go zipping through timber going on to manor you got kids you got a lot of traffic along that way especially with the former i don't know if that bike path is still going to be back behind where the country club is but we still have a lot of biking people walking their dogs my kids play out in the front yard and that not only just the headlight aspect of the nighttime yeah being able to be shining through but also just if you're going up at a high rate of speed uh, that's my biggest concern with this option. We really um, appreciate more of option three, where it jutted out a little bit more. Um, we know that the you know the planning commission with fire and police that was not their option, but from a residential standpoint, this makes me nervous. And that's all I think I can really say about it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Michelle? They're not right next to each other, so I'll have an hour for time. Hello, um, my name is Mike Gomez. I live at 227 Pimrick. Um, be just a few houses. I'm the last house. Uh, right, right next to the park. Um, question for the designers. Um, what type of uh, traffic impact analysis was done? Was it uh, based on speed, traffic counts? I, I mean, when was it done, first of all? How long ago was it done? It was, it was done uh, back in the spring. Okay, because I never, I mean, I, I live there. I've never ever seen any kind of traffic measuring 
systems anywhere it, on Tamarick or driving through Tamarick, and I drive all over the place. I never seen it. So you guys have a, a theoretical one, or you have a, a, an actual? We did actual counts. And where where did that where was that done? Where were your where were your parameters? Where were at, at all the at all the turning movements on the Fisher uh, at Tamarick and Manor. And what was the average speed on Tamarick that you guys determined? It's, we're just doing counts. Okay, well, speed's pretty important, especially when we're talking about when you're coming up and you're creating a T, right? You go to most residents that have a, a session where there's a T somewhere where you're going to create your, it's on a very low speed residential area. Timrick, no matter what the speed limit is, is not a low speed traveled area. You know, they, from Ridge Road to Calumet, that's the shortcut that people take. And believe me, I, sometimes on a, on, a, on an evening, get out of my driveway, take 10 minutes because there's that much traffic. So when you guys did your traffic analysis, was it based on the traffic that's actually happening today? Or did you go off the analysis done for the railroad crossing to his point? What's going to happen when those, you know, everyone says 30 seconds. So we know that's not true. We all wait for trains, whether it's cheap or not. It takes a long time. The lights come on, 15 seconds before those arms come down, or 30 seconds before the arms come down. So if you take the time, but you got to stop when the lights are going down. And the arms come down and the train clears and it opens, it's more like a minute. Okay. So did you take your analysis and compare it to the analysis used when they designed that railroad crossing? And what's it going to look like in reality, not what it's looking like with the analysis you did? Did you do both or did you just do a traffic study based on current traffic? We do current traffic and we project out. Uh, did you project out using the information used to approve the traffic study that was built for the crossing and the, and the rail project that they're doing now? No. Shouldn't you do that? I mean, you know, we're creating a situation where we're building a, a you know, a transit, you know, train that's going to go through that street and it's going to back traffic up on a street that gets pretty backed up already. And whatever theoretical traffic count they assume is going to happen because of that, it's really going to impact what you're doing. And really, that's what's going to decide which four of the pick ones you pick. Really, what's going to be the safest? It's what's going to slow traffic down, or we have that speed bumps on Timrick that go from however far so one what, direction. I guess I want to make sure that I'm moving down my so I mean what you're referring to though is neighborhood traffic to the north outside of our project boundaries. No, that's your project boundaries center. I mean everything that flows through Timrick to now right. right now is currently flowing through Timrick through Fisher. And so with a with a, a traffic study you look at the, the turning movements, the quantity of traffic you project out into the future to see how much it's going to increase. You're talking about, so I mean, I, I, help me understand what it's well, trying to Well, right now you're, I don't even mind. Right now you're built, they're building a railroad across the way up out here. It's not in your drawing for. No, it's, it's, it's right there. It's right there. It's right there. Oh, it's right there. Okay, so this, that's right. But what, so, so this right now, no one knows. I mean, they obviously came up with a theoretical traffic count of what's going to happen when those arms go down, how long it takes down, and how no, traffic can be That doesn't change the traffic count. But it's going to change the impact traffic flow. But as you, you heard from staff for 30 seconds, when the train's going through. Yeah, yeah so, but it's still, they come through, and it's still, the traffic's already, like I said, but there, there's already a challenge there with traffic. Right. Without stop signs, without so, changing the but, topography, without changing anything. There's already a challenge with people with speed. There's already a challenge with too much traffic that cuts through from Ridge to uh, uh, Calumet. There's a lot of there's a lot of things that are going on there. And when you, you decide which one of the four you're going to pick, it really needs to come down to what's going to slow the traffic down, what's going to make pedestrians safe, kind of all the things you talked about. But you really got to you got to make sure that you're looking at what we really think the traffic's going to look like when those arms come down, or how many times a day they do come down, and what hours they come down. All that's all that should be included in a decision being made for this project. That's what I got. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gomez. Would anyone else like to speak? State your name and address and please and sign in. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Bontanecki, and I live at 8822 Manor, um, which is the lot that is directly 
adjacent to the topmost uh, green space area. Um, I know you said that you've uh, spoken to residents about landscaping, stuff like that. I have never heard from anybody at any point. And this directly abuts my property. Um, so I don't know who you talked to, but I've never seen it before. Um, is there going to be some sort of barrier between my property and the public property? Because there's a park there now. Um, it's pretty underutilized, but I'm guessing with all these beautiful plans, there's going to be all kinds of stuff going on there. And I don't even have a fence because I've never needed one. Um, what, what, what happens to my property here? Like, is there any sort of barrier between this public land and my land? So Jason, you're immediately adjacent to the park. Can you point your house? You can do it on this one here so we can see. Oh, sure. <laughs> and then that one's the vacancy. <laughs> my house is right here. It's still going to be a park. There's a park, there's a park there now, isn't it? Yes, there's a park there now. Um, but the park is pretty underutilized because there's nothing there. Nothing. Like there was a basketball court right here is where I am. And they took out the basketball court. So now it's really just this disused piece of property. Um, and I'm all for, you know, prettying that up and because it's sort of like a neglected corner of Munster. Um, but if they're going to make it bigger or, or, you know, clean it up, make it look nicer and like that, I'm assuming they're going to do something else with that land. And I want to know if that's going to make it more populated, probably. So is there going to be any sort of barrier, landscaping, fencing, something between my property and that park property now that it's going to be more utilized than it's been in the past? Um, I can respond partially to your question. Uh, first, the indication that I've received from the parks director is that this will remain a passive open space. Um, there's a actual more active playground, active park just northwest of here. Um, so the idea is not necessarily to, you know, turn this into a, uh, a very active space and attract a lot of people. It's, it's intended to be sort of passive open space. Um, so that's maybe answers your question as far as what the plans are. That being said, I mean, it's going to be parkland for a long time. So things can change over the years, I'm sure. Um, with respect to any kind of screening or, um, you know, fencing, between park property and your property. Um, there is a condition in this approval that says um, they need to come up with a plan for the landscaping and improvement of those, those park areas. Okay. So that can definitely be taken into consideration when those plans are put together and ultimately approved by the park board. Thanks. Hey, uh, Tom, can, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, I'd like to just uh, add to that a little bit. Um, our intent in, in the revised development plan is to actually put uh, fencing between all residential parcels uh, and the park space. So, uh, yeah, we, we haven't shown that, uh, but that is certainly our intent. Uh, we did have that discussion uh, with, uh, with uh, a couple other of the, the properties. So, yeah, I apologize that we didn't do that on, the, on, on at uh, 8822. A big reason because there's no change uh, between the park as it exists today, other than we're gonna, uh, our intent is to take that asphalt out of there and make it, like you said, passive green space. So just because there was no change, that's that's the reason we really didn't reach out, but our intent would, yes, to be buffer all residential homes with uh, fencing uh, along the park. And, and we'll work with the individual homeowners and the town uh, in terms of coming up with a, uh, with a fencing design that that's aesthetic and 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 makes everyone happy. Thank you. Hi, my name is Patrick Goodson, and my wife and I live here. We live at 202 Chimerick, which is more closer to Holman Avenue. There, we're Holman. Uh, I don't think it's on here, but Holman Avenue intersects it. 
and up there and further up there. Two tenths of a mile of the manor. So it's um we're like up here and over there in Holman Avenue, where Holman Avenue comes in. Um I'm I'm we're behind on the information. We just heard about this basically Saturday evening and uh Fisher Street is that is that gonna go off in Illinois there? Is that right? Is that gonna connect with Wentworth or as of now, no. So what is being developed at the Lansing Sportsman's Club? The prop on the have a drawing of the <clears throat> part of the property is in Munster. Yeah. Uh, the Lansing part of the property is in Munster. The Munster property is being developed, not the Lansing part. So the uh, by the Lansing Sportsman's Club there? Yeah, it's all yeah. it's all it's the old Lansing Sportsman's Club, right. the Lansing Sportsman's Club over half of it, three quarters of it was actually Munster property. Okay, because that, that's kind of our backyard. Our backyard is the bike trail, and then we look at the lake and Lansing Sports right. right there. So this is uh this is the master um, conceptual master plan for the development. Mm -hmm. Um phase two which is actually the first phase of the development is approximately 300,000 square feet of uh, commercial office space. Um, phase three, as proposed now, as shown on this plan, is a, approximately 500,000 square feet of additional commercial office space. So where is Timrick and Fisher? So Fisher Street is right here. And Timrick is approximately right here. It's got me turned around. Let me go to another. Uh, let me pray. I'm sorry. Do you, do you see the condos from your backyard, the condos in Lansing, the white ones? Is that no. when you see no. them? Okay, you're not, you're not that we close. We see the lake. The we lake, see the okay. lake, yeah. One of the lakes there. I don't yeah, know. You're, at, you're on the north lake, not the south. So all this development is, is relatively far south of, of where you are. If you can't see, I don't know what number hole it was, uh, but they're actually golf holes where the where this phase two is uh, planned. Okay, this, this might help you a little bit. So this is Fisher, this is Timrick. This is the development parcel. So Fisher is extended to the west into the development parcel. Um, this is an existing Nipsco right away. This is a bike trail. So we're more here, yeah. Okay. So that, that we, and as this gentleman spoke at Timrick, they, near, and you guys have probably heard this, Timrick and Holman, no one stops for that stop sign. And there is a park just a little bit south of that, mm -hmm. if you want to call it so. No, no one stops at all. They just, they run right through it. That, that corner there, like I mentioned, it's high speed track. There's a park there. You got flashing lights, but nobody stops. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you, if it was probably up to the residents around Timber, if you asked them what they would want, I, I would be in favor of cuddle snack, which I know we're cutting off, but that would stop the traffic there because there, you, it is the main cut through from Illinois. To the hospital to Calumet Avenue. So, I mean, that's that's what I think. Uh, I know I think we would be in favor of that if we were looking at all our options. But, and that, no matter what goes on here, the train is a very good thing there. What's going to happen with the traffic there? A very good position there. But um, I, I don't know what's going to happen there, but what, what they can do is either put stop signs or speed bumps. A long term timber and maybe enforce the tickets there, you know. Like even at every intersection, put stop signs. Well, I was told that they don't want to do that because it's an ambulance route. Well, the ambulance doesn't have to stop at this house. But we do. So, I mean, if it's the reason it's an ambulance route, it put the stop signs at every intersection and then slow that traffic down. Because then, I mean, it, it's even hard for the kids. To even cross the street to get to that park. And people are blow, I mean, they're flying by it. They don't, they seldom stop at home or to do it. So I got I thanks for hearing me out on that. Thank you, Mr. Vincent. I just want to add just 
state your name and address and sign it as well. Eileen Woodard and 202 Taylor. And uh, I guess my concern is that uh, if you look right now on GPS, eight o'clock at night on a Tuesday night, you've got, uh, I think it's, I don't know, anyway, um, it takes five minutes. It says five minutes from Holman Avenue to Manor. There's no way. It's a 25 mile an hour zone. And I used to sit, so I went online with the paper. I used to sit on the front porch and the fifteen. And nobody does that choice us, which is pitiful at home and, and Tim. Now you get you get a train and then you have a, in another intersection at the at the manor and Timur. And traffic will be back. It'll be back up home in, up home in Avenue. And then you're going to have more traffic down that next block. Um, I'm not sure what block it is, but first Forest East, Avenue or to go in the last year. Oh, no. The first east and west past Timber. Um, anyway. Everything, everything. So it, it, it did, speed is a problem. And I don't think that the ambulances are going to go for speed bumps, but uh, there, there's definitely problems. Every once in a while, the police will show and they'll stop the people that are going to stop sign off the home. But, uh, you know, like right now, even the way it is, it is an awkward turn there onto Tim and onto Fisher. But um, at least the awkward turn makes it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? I have one more question. Come on up again. Are, are they sure. going to talk? Uh, are, are they, is anyone else going to come around and talk to the neighbors there at all? Well, this will be a continuing, pro, continuous process that we always meet on the second Tuesday of the month. And if you go on the Town of Munster website, it'll show the agenda for that evening. So whenever the Ken Mara is on here, we'd love that people come here and hear the feedback. And, and can uh, the public zoom in at all too, or do we have to, we have to come in? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. They just said no one's talked to us yet. Yeah, so the, zoom, the Zoom details are always at the top of the agenda. Okay. I have one last thing is, we did talk about phase three where traffic signals gonna go in. Yeah. And there's no doubt that once you put a traffic signal and you got the river crossing signal, and, and how that's going to you know, correlate and what's going to go on and what those studies really show would be really interesting. I mean, so are those traffic studies available for us to look at? Yes. Uh, they have been, yeah, they're not in this agenda, but they've done a previous agendas. Um, but we can also. And, and again, did those traffic them. studies uh, incorporate the new situation that we're currently dealing with right now? Or they just, I, I believe so. I guess I'm still unclear as to what that means. Uh, well, it's pretty the simple. They're going to build a, a railroad crossing, and the traffic is going to change. And there's going to be more backed up traffic because it's probably more like a minute every time the train goes by, however many times a day it's going to go by. And with the traffic signal there, you're going to have green and red lights. And if they're at the same time, I mean, how bad is it going to be backed up? What does that mean? Because Nikki did a traffic study, didn't it, Tom? But Fisher sure. did, yeah. I think that's the question is that was the Nikki traffic study for Fisher incorporated to the traffic study that you referenced? Is that have, true, Mr. Gomez? Yes. I would have to check with my chat. 10 4. He doesn't know. I know there's some questions now. Would you like to direct them to the petitioner or to Tom? Councilman, you had some. Yeah, yeah. it's probably more for Tom. Um, just hearing some of the feedback, zooming in and out, looking at this situation. I actually grew up on Briarland, so I'm fairly familiar with this um, neighborhood as well. I know we're looking at, and we're doing studies of traffic calming features elsewhere in town. It seems like this neighborhood would be a good. Um, candidate to put some of the more effective traffic calming 
measures in here, if there's speed humps or chicanes or whatever we come up with as this development comes along. So that's more of a comment. Yeah, we've done, we have done uh, speed studies on Timrick. I don't have that information at hand uh, because it, uh, this proposal that we have here is, if anything, going to slow the traffic on Timrick because it does add a stop sign into uh, that corridor where currently there is none. It just kind of curves around and connects to Fisher Street. Um, but we are aware, town, all town staff, I think everyone on the town is aware that there's a speeding problem in this neighborhood. And yeah, we've kind of taken the first steps is collecting the data to kind of quantify and see where the, you know, where it's actually happening and the, what the most effective measures would be to uh, try to call that, I should say. Yeah, I think that will be important, especially as you imagine whatever sort of occupants are going to be there, if there's nice green space, if there's more bicycle connectivity. I can imagine people having lunch and really enjoying themselves in there. So, um, you know, that the town will be cognizant of keeping that as safe as possible. Um, my question related to that is could you help, help I'm, I'm trying to think about it in my own head as uh, Mr. Gomez has, has pointed out, can you help us understand what the situation would be like after the stoplight is installed at that corner? Like how would that, how do you envision or how should we think about how that impacts traffic flow? Uh, as there's a green light open, it should allow traffic. I mean, this should improve traffic flow rather than harm traffic flow. But I'm not traffic sure. Signal? Yeah, 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 the traffic signal. Uh, so yeah, the traffic signal essentially you know, rather than having everybody, I mean, you all know this, rather than having everybody stop and take turns, it sort of releases cars in groups so that they can clear the, if there's a backup on Manor Avenue, it'll back up to a certain point and then the entire thing will sort of flush clear. Instead of it being stuck there. Instead of it, you know, one by one. Right. And it'll also, what that does is it also allows for gaps. So if there is a you know, a car on Timrick waiting to turn onto Manor, it will create a gap in the, in the, tra in the traffic that allow it to do that. So it's not backed up onto Manor and you're stuck there because, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I see there's a turn lane, a northbound left-hand turn lane being added. How will that impact traffic flow? Um, I mean, it, I don't think it'll, it won't have any real change to, it's not gonna like improve the existing traffic flow because it's so different what's being proposed that, yeah, I mean, that'll just allow for additional fluidity to the east. So by adding that middle lane, you'll be able to have more flow going through there when the light's green, when there's a light. Okay, uh, hopefully that was helpful for me. I hope it was helpful for others. Yeah. I have a question. Are, are we planning on putting any stop signs over the current timber and manor and on the picture? I think if we actually put a stop sign on manor, come to the tunnel south on manor to get the picture, we have a stop sign there. Um, well, the plan would be to have a stop sign at timber. On camera and right stop sign here. Are you suggesting one at yeah. one right there? Because you're going to actually, I mean, if everybody's coming down Manor, you're going to get a backup on Timber if those cars are not allowed to actually get on the Manor. You actually have a, I know it's a short distance, don't get me wrong, but if you actually yeah. slow everything up on Manor at that intersection, at least that way you can take turns before you get to Fisher, that'll calm traffic too. Um, it does. I mean, that, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this as this one does. It, it's a tough call. I mean, it just is a tough call. But I'm looking at this and like Timmer's going to be backed up all the way up the whole yeah. way. You know, if you're just having a stop sign on Timmer on the manor, Timmer's really going to back up up to Holman, and you're going to pray. You're going to have to pray that people that are on manor are going to get out of kindness of their heart. They're going to allow those cars in 
that she get off the fisher. And I have an issue with the kindness of people's hearts these days. So uh, I think that's what the traffic center was. But don't sure. you think, though, Councilman, that after a certain amount of time, if people are using that as a shortcut, eventually they're going to know it's going to back up and they're not going to take it anymore? Mm -hmm. And then maybe jump over at, at Evergreen and, yeah. and cut over banner there. Um, I mean, eventually, if I'm going to sit and wait for a real long time for a consistent period of time, I'm not going that way. Yeah, I understand. I think it's been worse lately because of it, because uh, the Borman Expressway has been so messed up. So everyone's getting off at Torrance and Calumet and finding different ways around mm -hmm. because you have to get the 30. Once that construction opens up, I think people are going to stay on the highway for more. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's good. Another question. Thank you. Um, I my concern, I, I heard a rumor when I came to vote that Bridge Road between uh, State Line and Manor is going to be one way each direction. Is that is that a rumor or is that something that is in the plan? And then the other thing is that uh, I guess, you know, Holman Avenue to Timrick, like I said, Timrick, or Holman Avenue to Manor, two tenths of a minute. Noise is also a problem. And if I, I, I know they're upset at some kind of, we need to hear people's radios in your cars. You know how it is. And probably my high school. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Or, you know, you know, even the motorcycles would be, you know, everywhere. That is an issue. But, uh, you know, it's it's nice to say that. So. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to bring something up, and I know it's unpopular, but Wentworth. Why are we at least just showing an option connecting to Wentworth? Why are we taking on all of this? Yeah, I mean, that's one of Gary. That's one of proposals you talked about is having connections through either Wentworth or another way to be able to connect traffic to another uh, main artery to get out of this area. Yeah, we looked at that, uh, you know, quite extensively. We're, we're relatively, you know, ambivalent about the connection. We don't really need it right now. We don't anticipate uh, development at the present time in, in Lance on the Lansing side. However, we do know that that connector would relieve a substantial amount of traffic out of the neighborhood, uh, you know, around Timrick and uh, west of Manor, uh, because that is a cut through. It's a cut through to get to the hospitals. And, and as Ridge Road becomes constricted, uh, it, it, it's something I think we should look at. Uh, I think it's going to take some study. I think the traffic uh, overall, just, just a, a, a quick point uh, to the gentleman who was asking about the traffic study, uh, we're really transparent. I mean, if uh, we'd love you to see it, it's, it's over 200 pages. It's a very extensive uh, study of traffic in the area. Um, we can, uh, you know, we thought about uh, taking some time to amend that because of some newer things that are happening. Uh, such as Ridge Road, uh, uh, we did consider the train. Uh, we do have, and you'll see in the next uh, phase 1B, uh, there is a major connection from this park that goes down to Maple Leaf Crossing uh, south on Calumet. So this is by far not the only connector in the area. Uh, but I, I think we should we should just all uh, look at uh, look at, at, at several options uh, that exist. Um, we do think this, uh, uh, we've studied this particular intersection we're looking at on the screen right now uh, in quite a bit of detail. As you know, we've looked at uh, and worked with the town on several different iterations. We've all collectively agreed uh, there is no perfect solution. Uh, this is probably the best. Um, we've had concurrence with police, fire, parks. Uh, so we've really uh, studied this for some time. Uh, we did reach out to the owners uh, that the two residential homes uh, north, that, that's uh, eight, uh, 8841 and 8837. Uh, we, we've listened to the, uh, the potential problem with safety, which is by far our number one concern, uh, whether we do some kind of a, 
a rock uh, barrier, guardrail, heavily landscaped. I think we can, we'll work with both of those homeowners to come up with something that is uh, both safe and very attractive. Uh, the, the overwhelming thing that you'll see at this intersection, and, and you can't really see it on this plan, but we have been working uh, extensively with NIPSCO on the entire green space between Calumet Avenue and Manor. Uh, so now you see an area that looks like it's littered with, uh, with electrical infrastructure. Uh, we're proposing some fairly extensive improvements to this whole corridor, adding green space, adding trails, adding connectivity to the lakes. So overall, this is gonna be a tremendous benefit and it's gonna add a lot of value to the area. Yes, we have to take care of traffic. We, we all have to work together on that because uh, there are solutions here. Uh, and, the, and the traffic that's happening today from Timrick uh, and um, it's been happening for a long time. I mean, it's not a, it's not a product uh, of our development. It's a product of uh, people taking shortcuts. So I, I think we should look at, uh, we should look at the connection to Wentworth. Um, there are pros and cons there as well, but uh, I, I think we're, we, we're looking at this as a solution, uh, not a problem. Thank you, Gary. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Tom, this is for you again, and I'm gonna start beating on this development agreement thing. Why are all the contingencies that are requested by the staff not a part of a development agreement? And why are you pushing out of the planning commission? I'm having a real tough time with that. Because wouldn't all of these things normally be addressed in a development agreement? Um, no, typically not. I don't think that the town council and the redevelopment commission would typically be approving the uh, re you know the reorganization of roadways the appropriate time to install yeah, the all the new roadways in though they do that in all the developments right which get approved by the planning commission yeah typically the planning commission is approved these are all related to the development of land and that's why i think the planning commission has the has a responsibility to review these things with respect to the conditions um well, I mean, this there, is a, there is a preliminary plat before you so you're Upon approval of the preliminary plat, the uh, developer has the ability to begin constructing public improvements. I would not suggest that we approve a preliminary plat and give the ability to the developer to begin constructing public improvements until these conditions have been met. And that's why these conditions are in there. Well, wouldn't one of the conditions then be a development agreement? Uh, Bill, Bill, can I can I speak to that for a minute? Um, sure. it, it, it is inherently, and I and and, and our plan is uh, we we submitted uh, a development plan and our development agreement both in April of this year. So the development plan is is uh, fairly extensive, and I believe that's the place where we put in the engineering and all these conditions. Because because keep in mind we have a lot of conditions with NIPSCO. With Pepsi, NICD, uh, those have all been substantially uh, complete, uh, but the development plan is actually referenced and in the development agreement. So there is some, there has to be some uh, consistency between the budgets of the, and the scope of those two plans, uh, because the whole reason for the development agreement, obviously, is is to look at. Uh, at, at tax increment and how that's going to help get all this public infrastructure done. So I would propose, if we could make this real simple, uh, we're, as Tom just stated, uh, nothing is going to get done here without uh, the development plan uh, being, uh, being updated and being consistent with all the engineering that satisfies all the conditions. So inherently, the the, 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 all of the technology or all the tech uh, uh, technical requirements that we're discussing aren't really in the development agreement, but they sort of are because they're going to be in the development plan. So I'm proposing that we uh, th that we allow phase one and phase one a planning to move forward, uh, so then we can. Uh, revise the development plan get that into the development agreement uh, all at the same time. Uh, it, it's it's a little counterintuitive, but we can't complete the engineering until we have the plat fairly well resolved. 
So I, I think it all ties together and I think there's a process to do that. Thank you. I have one. We talked about the bike path and the sidewalk um, being installed. And Gary had mentioned the improvements to Fisher, which we haven't been talking so much about because this is about the intersection. I was wondering if you could show or describe like how the sidewalk improvements and bike path will be in this area. Yeah, uh, Dan, uh, Tom, could you go to the slide deck that Daniel presented and maybe go to that very last slide? I think that probably is the one that best captures the, the greenway improvements. There you go. Yep, that's it. Yeah, that, yeah that's it. Um, so there are some pretty extensive uh, greenway improvements uh, here. They are budgeted. They are in the development plan. Um, there's uh, uh, a, a lot of discussion between the Cook County Forest Preserve District, uh, the Pensy Greenway system. This becomes essentially one of the largest trail systems in in the mid in Midwest America. It's 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 going to be extensive, uh, and it it just so happens that. Uh, this part of Munster becomes the last mile for that connector. The most important one is the, is the Pensy Greenway that will, the dotted lines, green dotted lines exist today. The heavy green lines uh, are being proposed. Uh, the most significant will be the connection of the Pensy Greenway that'll connect uh, the lakes at uh, Kenmara, former Lansing Country Club, all the way to Centennial Park. Um, and then as you can see, that intersection, Fisher Manor, Timrick, uh, there will be a fair amount of, of, uh, of pedestrian connectivity. Uh, the one place where I think that we're gonna have to spend a little time, uh, and we have a little difference uh, with town planning on this one is, is, is trying to squeeze greenways on both sides of Fisher when they cross the grade crossing at at the tracks, I, uh, we would prefer one. Uh, these are gonna be very wide uh, greenways. We're gonna uh, continue them through the NIPSCO property. Uh, but this is a, another part where I think uh, there's enough people involved in this thing where we should really get everyone together and get consensus on exactly how these uh, trails will ultimately be, be laid out. I think we're about 85% there now. We just need to clean up a few things. And I think that's gonna take input from uh, Parks and Rec, uh, maybe uh, even uh, uh, NERPSI. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of different organizations involved here, but this is gonna add a tremendous benefit to the, uh, to the community, which we need to just do it right. So there are some outstanding engineering issues uh, on crossings and, and connectivity. And Gary, your last comment, where there might be some disagreement, that's in relation to the dotted line along Fisher Street, is that correct? Yeah, it, it really relates to, uh, we could zoom in on that area. Maybe we go, Tom, we could go back to the uh, the plat, the illustrative drawing of the plat. It's it's just a matter of, of trying to squeeze the sidewalk between the NIPSCO substation uh, and the curb line. Uh, what we have done in some of the proposals we're working with NIPSCO on, we're envisioning a, a green wall in there, something that, that it, it's very unsightly you know, for the residents and, and, and anybody that's using these trails. We'd like to do some, some screening uh, on that NIPSCO substation, uh, green, green wall screening. Um, I just think that having two pedestrian crossings uh, on two sides of a grade, uh, commuter grade rail track is probably not a good idea. Um, it, it does kind of go counter to town standard uh, where you want to have uh, walkways on both sides of the street. This is a very unusual situation. Uh, I'd rather make a grand pedestrian crossing on one side, keep it safe, keep it neat. But that's that's it. I mean, the rest of the, the rest of it is, uh, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, but all these connectors in the area will will link through our property and ultimately link up to the entire Cook County Forest Preserve District. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.
Thank you. Mr. Goodson, you have a question? Yeah, Patrick Goodson, 202 Jim. Thank you. Um, if we wanted to keep traffic flowing, if Timber can fix you, why not leave it like it is? So uh, I can I uh, can I can it is um, and have the Fisher Street extended extended to the west. So this is this reconfiguration is order is in order to accommodate that extension of Fisher Street to the west. I, I'm like, couldn't you leave timber to Fisher like it is without all that? I mean, traffic would flow. You're going to have to stop at the rail. You wouldn't be messing up on that or having it there. But it would flow. Like it is until a, until the train stops. I understand a pedestrian crossing, but you're going to be having that anyway. I mean, you're, you know. So I don't think from uh, Daniel and Gary can answer this question either or as well, but from an engineering standpoint, I don't think it's possible to add a extension of Fisher West without modifying the Timrick and Manor Avenue intersection. The, 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 exist, the, the existing connection at Timrick and Manor is not safe. Uh, as you know, one of the reasons there's, you, there's so much uh, traffic traveling at high speeds, it's a direct shot. It's a three-way intersection. That would be like one of those intersections in the city that everyone comes to a head. And it's good, you know, like in Belmont, yeah, Lincoln, you know. What's now a three-way intersection? Well, I mean, the, the, main five, flow, right? the main flow is going to be Timber to Fisher. I don't know how much, how much flow is going back to it. A lot of flow? A lot of regular flow? Or just intermittent? To the west? Yeah. Will it be very busy? Um, I mean, it's 300,000 square feet of office space. A lot of buildings are going to be over there. 50 acres. Okay, we're adding two more intersections there. That's just that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anyone else online that wanted to speak? Okay. I don't see any hands, but if there's anyone on Zoom, who would like to speak during the public hearing, please unmute yourself and, and introduce yourself. So Gary, my question is the, the, the town conditions that they have in their staff report, barring uh, not having an executed development agreement, you know, um, is this something that's acceptable looking at the standards that staff is requesting um, for a motion for approval to work through these things? It's basically real close to what you're asking for because you're asking for an executed development agreement that would uh, talk about all these issues like traffic and landscaping, walkways, lighting, and town standards, correct? Yeah, that is correct. I think the easiest way to do it would be what we would ask uh, the town is for the uh, approval of the preliminary plat for phase one and, and one, one A and one B uh, subject to uh, a revised development plan uh, that would include uh, all the issues. And some of them require a little study. I, I, I get a little heartburn with some of the, the, the reasons for the traffic signal. Uh, you know, we if if it if it needs to happen, we're 100 percent behind it. We just want to make sure that it happens. Uh, it's 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 done the right way. Uh, so yeah, we we're we're generally good with that. Um, uh, and once we have the the plat approval, we can then now complete all of the engineering uh, that includes you know, landscape, it includes lighting. Uh, it'll include uh, some of the protective barriers and landscape uh, for 8841 and 8837. So it can include all of those things. And I think that's probably the, the easiest way to, uh, to, to, to make this happen. And, and 
you know, obviously nothing gets built or constructed until that uh, development plan uh, is revised and the development agreement uh, is executed. Tom, that's something you can take these and generate a, I mean, legally, Mr. Wickland, is that where you take these conditions and add them to a developmental agreement? I'll let Tom answer that. Okay. <laughs> Answering the legal questions. Um, from my so from my perspective, and you talked about this um, back just yesterday about the best way to uh, phrase these conditions. Um, I guess from my perspective, I think it's just clean to include them as conditions of the approval of the plan, uh, rather than saying approve the preliminary plan on the condition that you have a development agreement, which includes the conditions listed in this report. My suggestion is we just include these conditions as they're listed in the report as a condition of the preliminary plan. And then yes, there will be, develop, if there's a development agreement, there will be other things involved in that. Uh, that will include some of the stuff that is not necessarily gonna come to the planning commission, right? Like improvements to the Fisher Street streetscape. That's not gonna necessarily come to the planning commission. That'll be part of the development agreement. But these are all directly related to the layout and to the approval of this particular plat. And historically and traditionally, the Planning Commission has always acquired these things as a condition for a plat. So that's why I that, that's why I'm putting suggesting we put it in. But the plat is 1A and 1B is not even talking about all the stuff that we're beating to death on Manor and Timmer, right? 1A and 1B, so does 1A. that include that? This is plan. Yes, this is phase one A right here. That's one A. One B is the other connection. Is the public works component. One B is uh, the relocation of the public works. No, I mean public works. The town associated improvements is one A. Reconfigure it. Yes, this is one A. This is the improvements here are one A. And the plats that we're going to be creating the new tax parcels are just the green space that I'm looking at. Yes, it's the. And is that including also the configuration of the roadway? It is, yeah. There's the road. This is the actual plat. Doc. This is the actual plat document. This is the road right away being dedicated or transferred from the parks department to this street right away. This is the. Uh, residential lot that was purchased by Saxon Partners being replatted with a portion of it turned into a street right away, a portion of it turned into an out lot. These right here are two platted residential lots that are being replatted as an out lot and a street dedication. So, yeah, this is an actual plat. And we require that same one to be plats. So it's different in that it's not being platted for all development. development, but right. it is. And we have lighting and landscaping in it, and it's throwing me up. So, why are you making a contingency to make these little green spaces and reconfigure it to be able to make the access of development more palatable, yet putting all these conditions for landscaping and lighting when it's just part of a bigger town? developer agreement that happens later. At least that's how I'm thinking. I mean, because this looking at this is I'm like, okay, this is pretty straightforward. You have to do these to be able to gain access into the development. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. Community Foundation of Northwest Indiana. They platted three or four parcels. Some of those were one of them will be developed, two of them will not. Yeah, but they include water. But they included plans for the roads, yeah. the intersection, the public landscaping plan, right. streets, street trees, the traffic signal. All of those things are wrapped up into the approval of the plan. And yeah. this is different in that the developer is hoping to secure a development agreement with the town. Um, that's not that's in motion, but there's no approval. No approvals have been made on that. End. So I think from the planning commission's perspective. I would think that you would want to have your end tied up and done 
in a comprehensive way. That's that's all. Well, it's I, all going to go in there eventually. Yes, but why well, assume Gary doesn't want to build a road in nowhere, right, Gary? Yeah, exactly. I, you know, it's. Um, uh, I, I think this probably comes into. I, I don't know if you can do this, but maybe we should. Maybe it makes sense to look at phase 1B as well, so we kind of see the whole thing in context. Uh, but there are a number of, of engineering, uh, you know, additions and revisions that need to take place based on the conversations we've had and the work we've done with the town for the last, you know, six, eight months. So, and let alone NIPSCO, NICD, and Pepsi. So there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, engineering that will have to get approved anyway, but we can't really complete that engineering without having the preliminary plat uh, you know, approved, and it's only preliminary. Should we review one B at this time too, or just order to make them separate? I mean, is, they all tie together basically, don't they? Yeah, to me, I would go. I, if you can do this, it would make it would make sense to go to one B, and then maybe we just uh, uh, bring them up for motion at the same time, if if that's possible. But it's probably the easiest. Well, I mean, you've seen one B at a preliminary hearing. Um, I was just saying we have an audience here too. I didn't know how long they were going to stay if we were going to vote for right. That's up to you as the chairman. If you want to delay a motion until you've heard the heard 1B and also open and close the public hearing for 1B and make a motion on both, that's fine. It doesn't change my recommendation as far as what needs to get done um, as far as these plans, but. I'm not sure what information. I'm curious what information we'll see in 1B is which one back 1A. Well, they love this kind of stuff, so this would be good. <laughs> I mean, they're, about, they're young, younger than me, they're ready to rock and roll. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I recommend keeping a public hearing open for one, the first one, one A right now, still, right? Yes. Yes. Do you need a motion to table this, or can you go from one item to another? I think we can table both at the same time. What are you trying to accomplish? Why well, just to defer, like defer the defer the presentation on one B. Because it all ties together. One A and one B do tie together. Because they got access going on from Maple Leaf, they got access going on from Fish. Right? These are both yeah. Yeah. Right. They both need to get done for any of the stuff to move forward. Right? You have to, you have to go on one or the other. One or the other one. Right. So let's write it all. So, all right. So, so we're going to go. The public hearing part. We'll yeah. keep, we're going to keep open PC docket 22017 and move on to PC 22020 Spin Munster LLC representative here, Walpole, requesting approval of a preliminary plot for Kenmara, Kenmara Phase 1B dedication of Maple Leaf Boulevard. Tom, I'll start with you. Okay, let me get on the screen here. So we just looked at Phase 1A. I'm sure you're all aware. Uh, phase 1B is the southeast um, connection point between the proposed development at Lansing Country Club and uh, County Med Avenue. Uh, it's shown here on the screen and uh, it consists of um, a couple different segments which are shown there. It's legible. But essentially, what it comes down to is um, this is the existing Maple Leaf Boulevard, which is being constructed as part of the Maple Leaf Crossing development. Uh, the proposal is to extend this into the town owned uh, Pensy or Pennsylvania Railroad right of way, which is a 100 foot wide right of way, and uh, improve it with a two lane roadway and a 10 foot bike path. The roadway is shown here in gray, the bike path is shown here in dark black. Uh, and then there is a proposed driveway connection into the Pepsi bottling plant. Sorry about that. Um, it extends up north west. Um, at this point behind the Lake Business Center, the 
trail continues to the northwest along that Pennsylvania Railroad right of way and under the Mickey Railroad, which is shown here. Uh, at this point, the railroad is up on a bridge. And so the road itself swings to the west, goes under the railroad tracks, and connects into um, the Maple Leaf Crossing development. This area can run up. Yeah, sorry. This area is an easement or a right, right of way dedication from uh, NIPSCO, which owns this substation here uh, to the town to, a pub, to become a public road. So this is a 100% public road intended to be dedicated to the town uh, once it's constructed. Um, in addition to that uh, section that passes through the NIPSCO property, there's a small section right here, which kind of uh, goes over the corner of the Pepsi bottling plant. Um, so there's a separate document that shows that this little corner of Pepsi is being dedicated to the town. Uh, so that's the south, as I said, that's the southeast entrance. Um, I'll note that there is already an agreement between the town and Maple Leaf Crossing, Maple Leaf Crossing LLC, to install traffic signal here at the intersection of Maple Leaf Boulevard and Calumet Avenue. Um, and uh, there has been discussion about the trucks from the Pepsi facility exiting the Pepsi plant onto Calumet Avenue via this signalized intersection rather than what they're doing now, which is exiting onto Calumet here um, at an unsignalized intersection. So um, in addition to kind of providing access, additional access point into the Lansing Country Club, it also um, accomplishes the, <coughs> the sort of sorting out of some of this Pepsi traffic, as well as it implements the NC Greenway bike path, which has long been a town goal. Thank you, Tom. Any questions for Tom? And part of the bike path that's in the conditions, we would like it moved north of the driveway to Pepsi. Is that correct? That's correct. So we've had uh, a number of discussions about one point, one aspect of this plan, which is the crossing point for, or the crossing point when the bike trail crosses over Maple Leaf Boulevard. A uh, previous version of this plan had this driveway down here, and the bike trail crossed at the driveway. Mm -hmm. So there was a stop sign to allow the trucks to exit plants and to allow the bikes and pedestrians to cross the road. Um, the driveway was then moved to the Northwest at the request of Pepsi, I believe, um, but the bike crossing was kept here. Um, it's the recommendation of planning and engineering staff that this crossing be moved to coincide with this driveway so that you have a logical crossing point that's protected with the stop sign. Um, we understand that there is a very narrow strip of land within this right of way that isn't wetlands. So part of the reason why this trail is on the northeast side rather than the southwest is to avoid uh, the need to mitigate wetland loss. Um, so one of the conditions that we are recommending is that this crossing be relocated here unless it's determined to essentially be not feasible from a cost perspective. Cost per yeah. Which is something that we could likely work out in the development agreement. Okay. Any other questions? Tom? Uh, no, I think Tom covered that well. Um, there are some uh, drainage, uh, some engineering constrictions on where to do that, but we, we can figure that out. Uh, we intend on looking at it a little uh, more. And, and if it becomes a safety issue, uh, we, since that is a very long stretch of road, uh, and if we are going to cross at a location other than the Pepsi truck entrance, 
uh, we would want to put a, a stop sign, uh, have some traffic control there, uh, and that would that would prevent cars also from coming south through uh, through our development. You know, racing down to Calumet. It, it's just it's a very long straight stretch of road, so it, it might be a good idea to break it up. Thank you. That being said, this is a public hearing. So if anyone would like to speak on behalf of the public, same procedure, come on out and state your name and address for the record. As you can see, this is another access point out of, the, out of that new development. So it gives people access, obviously, hopefully to keep traffic down to Fisher when they have an alternative means and method to get over to Calumet from this development. Same thing, name and address. Different public hearing, same name and address. Back up to Georgia Tillery. Where, where is that going, Ellen Niner? Where is that? Uh, this doesn't. This comes from the Lansing Country Club property, cuts behind the uh, the Simboy property, you know, by Starbucks and that, and takes you right out to the Pepsi plant of County Avenue. So right now, this is no connection to, to Illinois. It's strictly from the Country Club property to County Avenue. South of Pepsi. So they're building the new buildings, the big uh, uh, hotel and office building. It's going to come out there. Come out right by the new Maple Leaf Crossing by 45th Street. Right, okay. It's just okay. I'm sorry. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Anyone on live, Tom? We do have a couple people online. If They'd like to make any comments or give any feedback. They can unmute themselves and introduce themselves and speak. Only once, only twice. Then I'll close the public hearing for for this one B. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Yes, Mr. Baker. So, uh, Mr. Van, what it says um, about the truck traffic coming out of Pepsi is that there's information provided by others about the Pepsi access. And it wasn't just Pepsi trucks. It had to do with the million square feet also warehouse space that's in the Simbar property that will also have access to that. I'm just curious in how traffic might be controlled if that's utilized more as a semi route, because it's a truck route, right? It's designed as a it truck is. route. And yes. I mean, it, it, if I'm being a betting man, I'll take the action on all the, the truck traffic happening between five and six in the morning because there's going to be more trucks than just at five and six in the morning. I understand the delivery trucks from Pepsi, but they also have to take product in and product goes out outside of just the delivery. My thoughts. And it's not just Pepsi. So I, I'm, I'm just. Bringing it up, this is similar to bringing up this stuff having to do with the Boyer project at Carpetland. It's just going to be busy and it's going to be high traffic and it's now busy and high traffic. Let me just point out that that's going to be what's going to manifest itself if we have a successful prop project, which I think we will. It's just making sure that there's accommodations for truck traffic in a very remote part of town. That's it. So I, you know, I mean, I, I can respond that the, you know, the traffic studies that were prepared both for Maple Leaf Crossing and for this development, um, both indicate that there's a lot of capacity at that intersection with that traffic signal. Um, I noted in my report that um, that Maple Leaf Boulevard Calumet Avenue intersection is projected to operate at a level of C or better. Um, but the vast majority of the day, uh, or the majority of time, even at full build out, it's still operating at level service A, which is, I don't think there's any other intersections in our town that are operating at public service could, A. Could you describe those for the public? Answer? Basically, free flow. Um, level of service C is still considered good, B is fine. Um, e is where you start to get. Perceived kind of congestion and then have this like gridlock. So, based on those studies that have been provided to the town, um, our judgment is that there will be additional capacity at that intersection to accommodate trucks from the Lake Business Center. Thank you. 
and it's this connection is not going to generate any additional trucks from either the Pepsi plant or the Lake Business Center. Um, what it's going to do is allow for the existing trucks, which are already exiting in a location that's not Right. So now those trucks will be given the opportunity to exit at a single so both options still. We have no plans to close off any access points to Calumet yeah. Avenue. We've talked about truckers before over by you know um Franciscan going into the whirlpool. You know how happy they are to follow the rules. <laughs> Just point that out. I know. Okay. And we haven't got out of place yet this year. Black Friday is nearly here. So that's typically when it ramps up. Um, but yeah, like I said, I think this is similar to the Fisher Manor Timrick intersection. This is there's a there's a bit of a problem on Calumet Avenue that's pre-existing. What this does is does it completely solve every aspect of that problem? No. But does it improve the situation? We believe that it will. Thank you. Any questions? Let's go. Okay. Let's go back to the first one then. They're both tied together. Any questions, concerns on 1A or 1B? Regarding the staff, if you want to let's go through that one first, and I'll look for direction from the commission on a, on a motion. Do uh, you have to close the public hearing for a while? Yes, it, yeah, it will close for that. So we're going back to the, the original one, PC docket 22017. Before I close the public hearing, is there any other questions or concerns on, on the, the original one we looked at, the 1A that's over by Timurek? And we'll be meeting about this about another two years. Yeah, so yeah, some this, area, though. This, is, this will keep going on. So <laughs> It's been going on yeah. forever and ever. We started talking about this train 10 years ago. Um, Name and address for Ron. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Chris Lazenecki, 8822 Manor. Um, when is all this? Like, I, <laughs> like. How would you like to be writing the checks for all this stuff? Oh, and, and, and in, no revenue. In some sense, I am. Um, we all are, right? Um, but like there's a house that the town has bought that's right on the corner there so they like dug up the whole yard they put in a nice new sidewalk but there's still this ratchet house sitting there it's been <laughs> empty for like i don't know a year and a half um yeah the windows are not out of it and would you like me to ask Gary a timeline once this first 1a and 1b is approved what he sees for engineering and timeline yeah, just, Gary, know, would you kind of give up? Yeah. Now, obviously, it depends on agreements with the town. Right. So there's lawyer legalese and all that to work mm -hmm. out and finance. Um, yeah, I can, I can, I, I can answer all of that. Uh, we we own three homes uh, at the corner of Timrick Manor Fisher. Uh, the work that was in the backyard of, of 8845 Manor was not us. Uh, that was NICTI uh, in getting ready for the utility crossings uh, at grade. Uh, our plan would be to get phase the plats done, the engineering done, but once we know that's going to happen, we have already proceeded with utility disconnects on those homes. We'd like to get those down right away because it just serves no purpose to have those those up. It would, uh, I think it would just make the neighborhood uh, feel a little bit better at this point. So. Would love to get that done uh, within the next couple months. Uh, the timeline is really being driven by NICTI. Uh, when they start that grade crossing at, at the tracks on Fisher, uh, that is the opportune time. And we're working very closely with, with, with both NIP, NIPSCO and NICTI. That would be the exact time to do these improvements so that when Fisher is closed, <clears throat> excuse me, it's closed once. And uh, we're coordinating very closely with that work. So that would be the time to do it uh, so that we can get Fisher closed, constructed, the grade crossing in and back and open. So that, that would be our, our timeline. So all this work uh, would really start commencing most likely late, late first quarter next year. Thank you. 
Thank you. Mr. Gomez? Yeah. Mike Gomez, uh, 227 Timmer. Hey, Jerry, one quick question. I, I realize that you guys took ownership of those three homes, but the, the windows being knocked out, or I know about six weeks ago, someone broke into the one that was on Fisher. I, I think it's was there. there. Um, that should be secure because that they never did end up secure. That window wasn't really broken, it was open to the basement. They never closed it. Like the police came, but that window still open to people still going in and out of there. Yeah, it was I, I uh, myself walking by a couple times, and then later on, I see someone's going in, right? So we don't ever need any uh riffraff in our neighborhood. And those houses yeah. should be secure, so we don't have to worry about who's in there doing what when I'm at work and, and not on my wife. Somebody yeah, speak. we'll go. The, yeah, it was that basement window. Somebody kicked it in. We'll we'll make sure that gets. Uh, it's, it's, right it's, even if it's two months from now, we know when it's snowing and it gets cold. It's probably not going to really happen this winter. So okay. until it does happen, we should make sure those windows are secure. I agree. I agree with you 100. percent right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gomez. Happy. Okay. Come on up. Name, name, and address. Adrian Woodard, two hundred two Chenoweth. Adrian Woodard, Goodson. <laughs> I just uh, real briefly, the en entrance to the little strip mall right across from Manor, will that be included in this in the stoplight situation? I think this where, the, where the little gym is right. and the, the little coffee oh, things for the triangle park. Because right now, um, people there's no stop coming out of that parking lot, and and people it would it would make fly a, onto that street. It would make a new it's essentially a four-way intersection with okay. Fisher and Manor. So I was just under curious. under a signalized condition that would all be part of it. Thank you. I'm gonna close the public hearing with no other comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. I'll bring that back to the, all your hard uh, work. And, and all your concerns are concerns that we traffic and speeding. It's all concerns. It's in my neighborhood. It's in your neighborhood. We want to make sure. You know, so much. Yeah. It's hard to right right right. and, and this might be an area. This might be an area where speed bumps might be worn to slow traffic down and stuff. I, mean, I live across the street from Park in Munster. No one stops by our stop sign. No. So, and you know, we're like this area. Yeah. All the schools yeah. are within walking distance. situation but I wish we want to get the roundabout with the big monument in the middle but I guess we won't get that right now so <laughs> we can get to that topic point yet so an obelisk an obelisk <laughs> MRI I would agree I would agree monster horse and monster yeah. right there right water tower yeah. Yeah. Water. Right. so that being said I'm looking for some kind of direction from uh, from the commission. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of condition staff brought up there. So, Mr. Chairman, yes, I was a move to approve PC docket number 22417, preliminary plot for the Kenmar Phase A, in addition to the Town Munster Commercial Subdivision located southwest corner of Timbrick Drive, Manor Avenue, and Fisher Street, with the uh, seven conditions that are listed, the six conditions that are listed, and granting a waiver from section 26335 of the Munster Subdivision Ordinance approving a right away width of less than 100 feet for a commercial street. Second. We have a motion and second. Is there any other discussion? No discussion. Town, please call roll. Councilor Coltrane? Yes. Councilor Chilowitzki? Yes. Rachel Brannigan? Yes. Bill Baker? Yes. 
Chairman Bradford. Yes. Thank you, Gary, on that one. Please continue to work with staff so we keep this project moving. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, the next item is PC 22020. Uh, I will read the whole thing. We'll bring that back to the commission. That's the uh, that's the 1B, which is a road to Maple Leaf Crossing. Looking for some direction from the commission. And once again, there's a bunch of conditions that staff recommended. I move we approve the preliminary plot with the conditions listed. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Time, would you please call roll. Councilor Coulter? Yes. Councilor Tuberlitsky? Yes. Rachel Brannigan? Yes. Bill Baker? Yes. Chairman Rathman? Yes. Um, motion passes. Thank you once again, Gary. Yep. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for your work. Um, the next item, the next item on the agenda is finance of facts, PC 22019, body layouts, requesting a zoning map amendment changing the zoning of the property at 545th Street from SDM Manufacturing C4B, General Urban B District with a special requirement ground for residential dwelling use restriction. It's a finding of fact. It, it had a chance to review this finding of fact. And if so, what's the, what's the wish of the commission? Come on, Rachel, make a motion. Sorry. I'm, <laughs> I late, it's late, it's late. Um, I was looking for the, the staff recommendation part. I didn't see the. He's right there. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, the written part. Yeah, sorry. We um, we prepare these findings and they're okay. just a, essentially a documentation of the decision that was made. Oh. So we're always recommending that they be approved. Okay. So I make a re recommendation to. A motion to approve uh, PC docket 22019. We have a motion second. second. We have a motion, second. Any discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, next item other business additional items for discussion PC 22021, Community Foundation of Northwest Indiana requesting approval of a final plot for Community Foundation. Next for this regularly scheduled meeting is December 13, 2022. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Sure, sure you want to finish it. You know, we can go on again if you want. We'll be adjourned. 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 It's four in the morning. We have a motion to second. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Thank you for doing the public service. <laughs> Oh, uh, congratulations, Rachel. Oh, <laughs> I do. Yeah, I do. All right. I just want to make sure you get one in there. Let your last two motion was a council. So, so yeah. I love five times. You got the report now? Is anybody doing the training tomorrow? The, uh, I will watch it. I am too. After. Yeah.